Well, I want to welcome you to Real Life, and today we're going to be talking about a topic that, quite frankly, listen, we talk about the title of it all the time, but we don't know much about it. And I'm talking about the word heaven. I'm talking about the place heaven. And so the reason why we're going to be going through this message is the fact that just recently I delivered a teaching uh, to uh, the congregation at the church that I pastor at in light of the fact that there's been so much trauma within the body of Christ. And I'm not just talking about our own church, but I'm talking about the church at large in the world. Things seem to be escalating, brother and sister in Christ. People are having more difficulties now than I've ever seen in 40 plus years of being a Christian. Challenges, defeats, victories, yes, but there's a general overall sense that there is a struggle going on. And so I wanna encourage you today in this message that we're gonna be looking at regarding heaven, that we need to not only think about it more, but we need to find out more about the doctrine of heaven, the theology of heaven, and what are some of the characteristics that heaven holds for us as believers. And so again, imagine, this is a brief message scratching on the surface of the vast and glorious opportunities and descriptions of what the Bible says is heaven for us who trust Jesus and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, I hope that you are blessed by this message. I hope that it makes a difference. I would really like to ask you to send it off to others, somehow invite others to watch it. It just very well might help someone to receive hope, to continue on, to live their life for Jesus in the face of difficulty. Because after all, when it's all said and done and when the Lord is done with us here, he's taken us to heaven. What will it be like? What can we hope for? It's God's desire that you and I see heaven. So stay tuned as we get into this special message. Today we're going to be talking about heaven. And in the brief time that we have together, uh, we'll just be scratching the surface. So I'm going to go fast today. I'm, I'm going to pray that you are at least stimulated enough to go search and find out about heaven. I'll begin in chapter 8, verse 1, if you pick up in verse 2 and so on. And um, we'll go down to verse 10. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, the topic is heaven. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Verse 9, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now turn to Revelation 21, if you would. Revelation chapter 21. As you're turning there, Jesus now introduces, you heard it a moment ago, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be in the kingdom of heaven. There's going to be a gathering together of all people who believe from the east from the West, we're talking about heaven. Revelation chapter 21, I'll begin in verse 1. John says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am now in the beginning. Wow. Verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Father, we ask of you now, Lord, in the hearing of this message and the reading of the word of God that, Father, we would be as a people very, very determined to follow you and to love on you and to know you and to see to it that in our own lives we repent of all those things that we just read a moment ago that are active and a life focused on the flesh and that we would have repented and come to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as we've read a moment ago from these passages, you want to give us heaven. You've invited us there. And so, Lord, we pray that you would teach us this morning. We ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. And as you are, considering heaven today, the Bible is plump with descriptions of heaven from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is really mentioning everything in light of the fact of eternity. And uh, for the record, and you saw that in the closing verse of Revelation 21.8, there is an eternity that exists, period. But within that eternity, there's eternal light and glory and salvation and joy and love and everything good, and on the other side of there is eternity that is that which is the reward of the flesh, that the things that we have done in our flesh and pursued for our own satisfaction, when we denied God and, and fled from God and pursued our own passions, to die in that state or that condition is certain ruin. But in this church, body of believers, I'm persuaded of the greater thing for you because you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, that the Bible makes it very clear that sinners are saved when they put their faith in the finished work of Christ, that all those who turn to him, who died on the cross there in your place, in my place, God was judging his son at the cross, not that his son had committed sin, but the Bible says that God went to the cross and the father placed all of our sin upon the atoning son of God, Jesus died in our place, and that on the third day he rose again from the dead to ensure our salvation. And for all those who put their trust in him, they inherit eternal life. As we look at this, we have Michelangelo's tremendous artistry, his great work of this famous uh, painting, and I don't know if you've ever, ever had a chance to to be in Rome or to be in places that display such incredible work. I know the Sistine Chapel, if you've been to Rome, you've taken a tour of that. But uh, getting back to Michelangelo, this is his rendering of God. This is God here with his outstretched right arm. It's been said that this display of his hand is the hand of power. That inside this orb of his great robe is future creation. That those within here are yet to be created, that this is in the mind of God. This side is the mind of God. You see various images here that are uh, 
coming to life, as it were, so to speak. Look at Eve over here. She's not yet created, but she's in the mind of God. I love that. It's awesome. And she's looking. I don't know if she's looking at... Well, she looks pleased. I should say that with Adam's looks. Uh, I guess he looks great to her. Michelangelo uh, renders this. Here you've got the, the arm, the left arm of weakness. So the right arm of God's power, the left arm of man's weakness. And you see where Adam's hand is, is uh, not alive yet. It's, it's going to come to strength. It's going to come to life when God touches or brings life into Adam. And Adam, of course, will become a living being. The Bible says that God will breathe into Adam the breath of life, and he will become a living soul. That the Spirit of God, it's almost as though if you've ever, I know young people today will not know what I'm talking about, but help me out here. Uh, in the olden days, I remember my, <clears throat> my dad was a farm boy on the farms of South Dakota, and I remember visiting there. It was okay. <laughs> Very far from the ocean, that's all I remember. <laughs> Uh, too far, but uh, to get water, uh, listen, listen my, my grandma and grandpa's house, they didn't have indoor plumbing, and uh, this was, my goodness, this was back in 1974, and uh, no, no indoor plumbing, you had to go to the bathroom outside at a different facility, and uh, to get water, uh, you had to, what was it, prime the pump, you, they had a pump, I can hear it in my ear right now, I can hear it in my head, you could prime, but you had to prime the pump, you always had to save some water to get the pump going. And then once you prime the pump, the water came out and theoretically the water comes out indefinitely, assuming the well doesn't go dry. In this moment of creation, when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, think of it for a moment both philosophically, physically, scientifically, God breathed into Adam the breath of life and the pump started. Imagine that, his cardiovascular system sprang into action, his heart began beating, his lungs began beating, Adam stood erect as a created man, a human. The Bible says in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 to 28, that it is God who created us in his image, that is his moral likeness. God gave you the human attributes that is native only to God, not to angels, not to animals, but God made you in his image. That means you can have reason, logic, you can have passion, and you can express, and you can have all of these in miniature, what, what God is in totality, yet he's perfect. We now are imperfect because of what happened at some time after Eve came forth. The Bible tells us that Eve sinned, and then when Adam was given opportunity, he didn't sin, he did something worse. Eve sinned, she was deceived by the devil, the Bible tells us, but Adam transgressed. Adam saw the sin of Eve, and he looked at God, he looked at Eve, he looked at God, he looked at Eve, and he chose Eve. And I'm not here to criticize him, there must have been a bond of love that no man, no person, no woman has ever experienced since. But it must have been something for Adam to love Eve and for Eve to love Adam because when they looked at God, they chose one another instead of God. Think of that. From that moment on, God has been working to redeem us back. Why? Because God wants us in heaven. God created a perfect world. Yes, in, built into that world was the world of choice. You say, Jack, if God created a perfect world, then why did it all go cockeyed and goof up? Because God introduced into that perfect world something called a human. If there was ever human error, the Garden of Eden had it. And that was Adam and Eve. Because God created these two people with a perfect ability to relate to one another in a mutual, willful exchange. You have that power today. God made mankind that way. We see no evidence of this regarding exactly fully as angels or as animals. You do. And you can exercise your true love by the decision you make. You can't have worship. You can't have love. You can't have a relationship unless you, by nature, introduce the option of choice. Are you with me? If I choose to be with you, then that is heartwarming. If you choose to be with me, that's heartwarming. And that is the basis of a true relationship. And that's the God of the Bible. He invites you. He, he wants you to be with him in heaven. 
So imagine what we're listening to right now coming out of the Bible, out of the Word of God, the magnitude of what takes place in eternity and what is taking place where the angels are singing, the saints are there as John shows us these tremendous moments in the book of Revelation and of course as Jesus speaks about the aspects of the heavenly throne. And listen, the, the whole fact that God is the creator. It was God's desire that he create Adam and Eve. And here's the wonderful thing, friend. Listen, God was not thwarted by Adam's sin. It didn't knock God off course. The brilliant truth is that when God, as Michelangelo depicts, stretched out his hand in that act of creation and brought forth Adam, uh, that was all in the foreknowledge of God. He knew that they would sin against him. In this remarkable foreknowledge, God had a plan of redemption. It wasn't an accident. It was God's perfect plan. So that whole area about sin and about choice and about eternity and about restoration and recreation, it is the gospel of God. So listen, let's pick it up and let's keep going in our study right now. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it in one of the great reasons. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you. Cheer up, everybody. God's working us. He's going to recreate us as human beings. Somebody say amen to that. He's going to recreate us, and that's an important word. I want you to understand this. He is not going to annihilate us and then bring us uh, a new world or a new life or, or a new Jack or a new Jill or a new Fred or a new Barney. No, listen. According to Bible doctrine, he's going to recreate us. He doesn't, he doesn't make you vaporize and then start over on you. According to the doctrine of resurrection found in the Bible, God is going to recreate you. He's going to resurrect you. He has to. Christian, listen. If you don't know, you better know it now. The Bible does not believe in reincarnation. That is Eastern mysticism and it's paganism. We do not believe in reincarnation. The Bible teaches resurrection. What does that mean? That means the Bible says the dust that we are, you know, we are dust. Did you know that? We're just really fancy looking dust. <laughs> that when we die, we return back to dust regarding the body. But read the fine print. The dust that we are is the dust that we go back to being in the earth. And that dust is never, never missed by God. The Bible says God will resurrect all those who have died believing in Christ unto glory. Amen. Unto glory. Listen. Read John chapter 5. And again, read the fine print. All human beings will be resurrected someday. All of them. By, the Bible says in John 5, some will be resurrected and condemned to hell. And some will be resurrected and enter into the glories of heaven. There's a resurrection for all. But the question is, where will you spend eternity? The Bible tells us in one story of creation that it's perfect. And then there's this, we'll just call intermediate time when man has been in a fallen state. And you may not like me saying that today, but just listen up, a fallen state. What does that mean? When we talk about you and I being created in the image of God and God has a plan for us in heaven... When you look at scripture, an overview of scripture, did you know, for example, that in heaven we will live very productive and very purposeful lives? You ever stop to think about that? Jesus mentions often what it's like in the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus tells us that our life lived here now for him in faithfulness actually translates in to future glories in eternity. How does that work? I don't know, except that what you and I do morally, ethically, spiritually matters to God and that currency translates into our eternal existence. See, you and I, we have a hard time focusing on that because we're physical creatures, too much so. We've, we focus too much on the physical nature of things. It's all about the body. It's all about how I look, how I feel, what's in it for me, where are we going? It's comfortable, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's very Cinderella-like. And God says, look beyond, look beyond. This is passing away, look beyond. And I thank God for all of you. These services, look, it's beautiful, honestly. Oh, services filled all day long, and I, I appreciate that. Because you know why? In my mind, I'm looking at the, the uh, pendulum swing to the other side. 300 yards from here is LA Fitness. Filled all day long. Okay, I don't know where you were at at six o'clock this morning, but that place was full at 6 a.m. this morning. What, what are they doing? Working on the body, working on the body, taking care of the body. Should we take care of our bodies, people? Absolutely. Why? Because we want to present them to God as useful tools. Okay? But you can go overboard, you know? And so if you think about it, what if some guy walks out of there and he's just like this? He's just like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger-ish like, and, and people go, oh, look at that guy. I bet you if Adam, if Adam were to see us today at our best, he'd say, what a pitiful thing. What is that? <laughs> Adam had a perfection that we have, have, have no knowledge of. We would probably see Adam and say, what is that? Because they were perfect. And the Bible tells us about a time coming when God will have you arrive in heaven and all of the sin and all of the suffering and all of the death and the war and the mayhem will be passed. Amen. And you will inherit eternity. And hallelujah, church, when you read the overview of the Bible, you will not be plucking harps in heaven next to <laughs> diaperless fat angels. <laughs> that will not be happening. Oh, but don't get me wrong. You will be in heaven, Psalm 150, among other places, praising God. It will be loud. Listen, it will be loud, the Bible says. The Bible says that there's great sound, great music, great worship in heaven. The Bible says that angels bow before God in heaven. The Bible tells us that they shout, and they mean it, by the way, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come, the Almighty. And the Bible says they say that day and night forever and ever. And the amazing thing is they mean it. Amen. It's not, oh, here we go. Okay, get up, get up. God, do it again. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. <laughs> yeah. No, they mean it. They're not like us. They know what's going on. All the saints are there. The Bible says all those who have died in Christ and died believing. Imagine that. Think about it. Noah's there. How did Noah get up there? Because he died believing that God would provide the sacrifice. How did Abraham get there? Abraham looked ahead to the builder of a city whose maker is not of human hands but a God. And that he looked to a sacrifice that would come. How do you get there? You look back to the sacrifice that came. Amen. It all comes together at the cross. Well, I hope that's a blessing to you. You know, that's that thing that we've often seen in cartoons or when the world begins to describe heaven, that it must be some place that's boring, that it's just little chubby angels plucking harps and, and clouds floating by. Hallelujah, no way. Thank God. You know, I, I just recently I came back from a trip of uh, going through the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. They are absolutely epic. And uh, they're so uh, rugged and they are so, so strong and, and so, so jagged that most of it is untouched by human hands. And it's something to look at. And I couldn't help but seeing such glory in this fallen world, such glory as that, speaking about God's creative powers, if we can stop and have our jaws drop in the face of such beauty, or to stand on some tropical island shore and to see a, a, a sunset that's beyond our ability to describe, how much more will heaven be? 
how much more will the glories of God's new universe, new earth, new creation be for the believer? It is going to be awesome. Anything but boring, anything but common. And so I want to encourage you as we pick it up in our next program together that, uh, again, you invite friends to come and watch and come and listen. Maybe you can have them join you as we consider heaven and all of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And to understand this, that it is God's perfect plan, that in all of the redemptive work of God, he not only redeems us by the cross of Christ, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, for what purpose? Because God will complete his perfect plan that man in sin paused, God will renew, God will redeem, God will recover. So friend, listen, no matter how hopeless you might feel, keep this in mind, our God restores and redeems. So I'm asking you to consider that as we get together in our next program. So listen, go ahead and tell people, invite people to join you or to just join us directly. And you can find out more by going to reallifewithjackhibbs.org, reallifewithjackhibbs.org. Or you can subscribe to us at YouTube and you can certainly follow us on Facebook. So we'd love to hear from you. But listen, uh, keep your hopes up because Christ desires you to be in heaven with him. And that's the topic we'll be getting back into in, in the second part of this next time together. God bless you until you see you then. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it, and one of the great reasons You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you.